analysis. Welcome. This week's uh, Wednesday night class. And the topic is, do you have boundary issues? Yeah, I see you nodding. I guess everybody in this earth has boundary issues. Some more than others. And... Um, so the, the question of boundary issues, of course, begins in the most personal way, in the most acute way, in the personal stage arena of personal life, boundaries as in relationships. Um, it's one thing to love somebody without any boundaries or borders or guidelines. That would make things simple. But however... Being that we are structured human beings, and uh, we sometimes, the name of love can cross boundaries, can blur boundaries. Sometimes the name of self-respect, we may create too many boundaries. So it's a big challenge is how do you create a balance? And of course, the challenge only gets more compounded by the fact that we learn about boundaries from our parents and from our adults that have shaped us when we were in our formative years, and they had boundary issues, most likely we will have boundary issues. Because that's what they, they said, the model. And uh, bottle injuries, can, boundary issues can even be down to the fact of what you see at home. Uh, even in the context of sexuality, how your parents, um, how openly they were. You know, loving people is one thing, but if they're too explicitly open in homes, it has effects on children. And sometimes the opposite, when you don't see any kindness or love, that creates walls. And uh, so boundaries are so much bound up in the issue of self-confidence, self-esteem. We also can suffer from what is called being the pleaser, which again touches upon boundaries. As you please, you have to please people. When the truth is, there are certain things you should be doing for others and certain things you shouldn't be doing for others. And often we buy, we try to buy affection with uh, going overboard in our uh, willingness to cooperate or please or not confront. So the list goes on and on and everybody has a different version, a different, uh, say, a different, a different way that manifests. But boundary issues are definitely an issue for everybody for some, it becomes it can be very destructive, one way or another, and for others, it may not be as pronounced, but it's still an issue. So that's on the personal level. You know, of course, I should mention as well. Um, you have people, for example, who, God forbid, their boundaries were violated as children, whether sexual boundaries, or emotional, or other form of boundaries. Like often, you have daughters who will describe their mothers have turned them into the mother, the mother was not around, and the daughters became the mother in the family. There you've got another boundary problem. And as a result, what happens is as we grow older and we start to struggle and grapple with our own boundaries, we often fluctuate from one extreme to the next. You'll find people who have been violated, you can find, find them being both promiscuous and also extremely, uh, what's the ex other extreme? Extremely um, uh, unreachable untouchable, extremely celibate, let's put it that way. Now, why the extremes? Because that's, that's what happens when there's boundaries. If the boundaries have been crossed too much, we can either respond by acting out without boundaries, or we can respond by putting up so many walls that nobody could enter. So this is, as I said, on a personal level, is a critical subject that affects us all, 
And many of us struggle with it because I don't even know that's what we're struggling with. Um, and others do know. So at least awarenesses have the cure. You're at least aware that there's an issue. That ele- so you can at least ha- be alert and vigilant about your boundary issues. But most people don't even know they have an issue there. They, that's part of the problem. They don't think there is an issue. They think that they're doing everything that seems normal because that's what they were exposed to. <clears throat> but if you go a step further, and I want to take it away from the personal for a moment, not because I don't want to address it, but I think it's also helpful to look at it in a broader context, in a philosophical and even in a scientific context. And that is, we live in a world where how would you define existence? How would you define life? Is life defined by boundaries or is it defined, defined by commonalities? Is, it, is existence defined by, by um, harmony or by individuality? So when you think broaden the subject matter, you realize that we live in a world and I, and I take it especially away from the subjective and emotional, personal experience. Let's look at it more objectively. You live in a world where both seem to be a very integral part of existence, is that there's boundaries. At the same time, there, there is, a, there is, a, um, there is um, um, cooperation. I mean, look at the natural kingdom of the animal kingdom, or the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, and you see tremendous symbiosis and harmony that exists in how creatures interact with each other. If you just look at, let's say, pl- pollination, how the bees are the ones that pollinate the flowers and return get their nectar and their, food, th- their sustenance, but through that they're also pollinating the flowers. And if it was done in, in a little imbalanced way, if there, no, if there, were, if there were boundaries, if it, boundaries would have been blurred there, they would either destroy the flowers or the bees would, be, would die. So you need the perfect balance of exact amount of um, bees pollinating and so on. And the same is true in the entire uh, uh, prey versus predator balance. If you think of the, you think of the, fascinating, um, the fascinating fact that the more a creature, or a vegetable for that matter, is consumed, the more it multiplies which means there are far more vegetables on earth than there are animals. And there are far more smaller animals than there are larger animals. And that balance is very precise. Because if, and we know today, if a predator is, is, uh, goes extinct, the prey that they kept a balanced number suddenly begins to explode in population and they can, be, they can destroy and consume in ways that destroy the whole ecosystem. So it's necessary, actually, that there should be a certain amount of prey every year that fall to the predators. Even though it's painful to see, and no one likes to see someone die, but there's a certain harmony there. And the same is true throughout the entire natural world. You find the constant balance between, fascinating balance between boundaries and commonality and, and, and the cooperation or coexistence. And should the, the boundary be in any way breached, Either the boundaries would be too, too strong or too weak, the whole thing would fall apart. As I can, you see it again and again. Let's take, take the most basic boundary of all that we're all familiar with water and land. Water and land is a fascinating thing. When you watch, when you stand at a beach and you watch the mighty ocean suddenly come to a humble, so called a humble, silent quieting as it reaches land. Something fascinating about it, because out there, the ocean in its own domain is the most powerful force that can, that can humble man and humble man's ships and everything we've ever created. The ocean is just so vast and powerful. And then as, as the waves begin to roll and gurgle onto the beach, you suddenly see it becomes so mild. Then, of, of course, there's the anomaly of a tsunami, a tsunami that we know, a tsunami where the entire boundary get, gets breached. And, land, and water does not know that it should stop, and it moves on to the land, and that creates, of course, tragedy, disaster. So you have in the verses in the Torah that talk actually about God literally, no pun intended, drawing a line in the sand and saying, till here is your place, water, and from here on is land's domain. So there you have the most fascinating boundary of all. The ocean in its own world is absolutely ferocious and untamable. But when it comes to the place where the boundary is set, the water stops and land begins. 
And the same is true if you look at our own personal life. Well, let's take another cosmo, uh, example of the cosmos. Let's take the sun and the earth. If the sun were a few hundred miles closer to earth, there would be no life. If the sun were a few hundred miles more distant from earth, there'd be no life. It'd either be, we would either freeze or we'd be burned. Just a few hundred miles. I don't know exactly what the number is. But it's actually fascinating because that balance is exactly, should do too far and it's too cold. We cannot survive without the heat, the warmth. Too close, we would burn up. So there's a balance that's going on in a person's, in, 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 the, in the universe in general. We'll soon get to the microscopic universe, but the macroscopic. And they're all reflected in the boundaries in our own systems. The human being. Study the human body. And you constantly see, you see the constant balance between boundaries and unification. Just take, for example, the process of um, uh, eating a meal, digesting a piece of food. Think of how many systems have to go, go, fall into place in this assembly line. You put the food in the mouth, the teeth break up down the food, the, the windpipe closes in order for the, for the, for the food pipe to, to activate then it has to come down the food pipe. It turns into mush. Then the acids begin to break down the digestive system, the separation between waste and nutrients, till it finally becomes blood. How many boundaries and balance you need there is, is amazing. And the truth is, every piece of technology is a balance between boundaries. Like, you know, you see electricity energizing the appliances in this room, the light bulbs, the computer, other things. If electricity flew too, flowed too intensely, it would blow the whole thing. Flew too, too, it was too minimal, it wouldn't have enough energy. So it's a constant gauging of how much and how little. Not more than necessary, not less than necessary. Now, in the natural world, it seems to just work. I mean, it's obviously the work of a designer makes it work. It doesn't just happen by accident. But when it comes to our personal lives, that's where it gets messy. We wish we could just do it naturally as the natural world does, then we would know exactly where, what, how much and how little, how close you should get and how much distance there, space there should be between two entities, two human beings. So just to, so broadening the subject, you see it's much a bigger issue than just on a personal level. It's a, it's a fundamental component to existence itself. And if you take it to another level, which is called the quantum mechanics level, you see, you find an interesting paradox, actually a very bizarre paradox, where physics as we know it until the early 20th century was what we call Newtonian physics, was defined by determinism. Determinism is a fundamental principle in nature. We know exactly when the sun will rise. We know exactly when it will set. We can predict everything like a clock. And nature follows rules. It's like the billiard ball effect. You hit a billiard ball this way, exactly the same direction, angle, and, and, and power, it will always have this, every cause will have all a predictable effect. And bottom line is, science is, a, a, is a, 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 a collection of mathematical equations. Two plus two always equals four, and that's that. If one day it equaled five and one day it equaled three, it wouldn't work. So it's a very clear structure, deterministic structure, with its boundaries and its limits and so on. You exert a certain amount of energy, let's say you're throwing an object, that energy will carry the object until the energy dissipates and the object will fall. Whether it's the power of gravity or the power of electromagnetism and so on, they're all predictable and most important deterministic states. But then in the early 20th century, the discoveries began to demonstrate that on a microscopic level, that's beyond our naked eye, beyond even our naked instruments, there's no instrument that can see the atom or subatomic particles, something was discovered which was very indeterministic. A, way, an, a, a, a ray of light was seen as both as a wave and as a particle. And the scientists came to the conclusion that in the microscopic level, things are indeterministic, some called states of probability, to the point that Einstein himself rejected these, these ideas because he says God doesn't play dice with the universe. There are rules. And Niels Bohr reportedly said to Einstein, res responded to him, don't tell God what to do. So there you have a conflict, in a way, between the macroscopic determinism 
and the microscopic indeterminism. And what it comes down to is that maybe that itself right there you have, because indeterminism is far more flowing, far more uh, unifying. <clears throat> Whereas determinism is very clear, boundaries, here's what the structures that are, this is where it, it stops here and begins here and so on. So the more you dig and the further you go into the understanding of, this, of the universe in which we live, you find this constant um, dance and balance between really opposites. What, who, is, who is saying the message that, you should do, that here there should be a boundary and suddenly saying, but here there should be a, combi- there should be a joining of, of forces? You, know, you think of it like a conductor of a symphony. A perfect symphony is exactly that. Each musician and each instrument is playing its moment, and they all combine for a beautiful harmony. But it's precisely because some are playing at certain moments and some are not. And then they, certain instruments they play together. And it's done in this perfect balance. The only real front frontier where we have difficulties with this is the personal one. Personal relationships one. But we're surrounded constantly. Everything around us dictates a very perfect balance between boundaries and um, what I was calling commonalities or unity or in- integration or however you want to call it. So maybe nature would be our best teacher to teach us how to balance the two. And definitely is, because when you look at nature, you can learn lessons, learn na- nature, not just nature, from our, my flesh I behold God. We can look at our own systems and, and learn from that. So if we didn't have healthy parents who taught us healthy boundaries, we have plenty of teachers out there. It's nature itself that teaches this. The boundary between the, the how boundaries themselves are necessary. And as we shall discuss, we'll soon find out that boundaries are actually not boundaries in that context. The boundaries are part of the unification of something. The fact that something stops at this doesn't mean that it no longer has a function. It simply means its function now is to stop and allow something else to enter. And we understand it that way, then it's not about a conflict at all. They work together hand in hand. And on the contrary, the, more, the healthier the boundaries, the healthier the unification. The, healthier. You know, the fact that the human body has so many different systems and different organs, and they all work, each one is doing its thing, is precisely what allows them to work together properly. If everyone was doing the same thing, that would not be healthy. If there was an organ uh, convention, and all the organs of the human body decided, you know what, this week we're all going to be the mind, and next week we're all going to be the heart, and next week we'll be the liver and the lungs, you'd have destruction. It's precisely you be the mind, you be the heart, you be the lungs, you be the liver, you be the, uh, the, the, all the other parts of the body. Do your thing, and then we join together as one. So the question is, how do you master that balance? If you can master that, then you can, you can learn to discover the secret to boundaries as well as to harmony. Now, let me go back to, uh, <clears throat> to um, explain why I decided to discuss it this week. Because what I usually do with this class is take some theme from either the chapter in the Torah or something from the time in which we are in, and, um, and, and derive lessons that are relevant to our personal, psychological, spiritual, and emotional lives. So being that tonight is Rosh Chodesh, is the new moon, is the new month of the second Adar. This is a, a leap year I've mentioned a number of times. Every 19 years there are seven leap years. Basically every two or three years there's a leap year, where we add an ad- additional month. By the way, this happens to also be a Gregorian calendar leap year, which is only one day extra in February, 29th day. But in the Hebrew calendar, because it's a lunar calendar, to reconcile between the solar cycle and the lunar cycle, we need every, approximately every three years, two or three years, an additional month, which compensates for the 11 and a half day deficit between the lunar and the solar cycle. So 11 and a half days... As essentially adds up every th- approximately every three years will be 33 days extra. So by get, adding a month of 30 days, you keep the balance of the lunar and the, si- and the solar, which is not now the time to talk. I discussed at length this topic many times. But as such, we are now, that, so the month of Adar, which is considered the last month of the lunar cycle. Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, we honor the beginning of the year. But there's another beginning. The lunar cycle begins in Nisan, the month of Passover. So the last month, the 11th month of the lunar year, is doubled, 
in a leap year. So we had two months of Adar. It was called Adar Rishan, Adar Sheni. The first Adar, the second Adar. We're now concluding Adar 1 and entering Adar 2. So there's an interesting Mishnah. A Mishnah is a statement in the, in the classic Talmud. In the basic Talmud, the Mishnah, there's the Mishnah Gemara. So the Mishnah says the following. Be'echad ba'adar, on the first day of Adar, mashmin, you announce ala shkolim ala klayim. You announce the need, the mitzvah, of giving the half shekel, the half coin, in order to, which, with which there's the donation, the donations of the Jewish people with which they purchased the public offerings that were brought in the times of the temple. And Klayim was the mitzvah of avoiding the mixing of certain species. Just like we don't mix wool and linen, the mixing of certain species when you plant your fields, that they should not be mixed. Certain things are, 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 are meant to be, grow separately. Essentially the concept of boundaries, as we shall soon discuss. Now let me elaborate a bit more. This is during the time of the temple, based on a verse in the Torah that we read a few weeks ago, it says that, uh, that you know, the Jews gave many donations to the temple of gold, silver, copper. In most cases, they gave according to their means. Someone who was wealthier gave more, someone who was less. But there was one donation that was meant to be an equal donation for all. It's called machzis shekel, the half coin. A shekel is a coin. Even today they call shkolim in Israel shekel. Shekel was the name of the coins in, in the ancient Israel as well. And a half shekel was like, think of it like a half dollar. And everyone was meant to give this half dollar when this, during this time, because as the year came to a close, the lunar year came to a close, so in the month of Nisan, when the temple was erected, when the temple was established, was that they renewed the year, so they did a new so-called appeal. It was a new appeal. So on Rosh Chodesh Shadr, the appeal stated that in the next, during this next month, everyone should make sure to bring their half, half shekels, for the offerings, which were used to purchase the offerings that were brought in the temple that were meant to be an atonement and, a, uh, and, 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 uh, and as well as a, uh, a elevation and a blessing for all the people. So that was one thing that was announced on this day. The second thing that was announced was Klayim, was the precaution to make sure that when you plant the fields, because this is now the beginning of the spring season in Israel, so now you're planting the fields, and so now is the time also to announce, make sure to keep certain species separate from one another, and don't graft certain species. Now there are species, no problem with grafting, but the Torah describes what's called klayim, mixing together, grafting, or some way joining hybrid species that are meant to kept, be kept apart, which is a law in the Torah, which is things to keep the boundaries. You don't crossbreed certain things. Here's not the place to go through all the detailed laws, but just suffice it to say there are laws about this which you can check out. The question is, what's the connection between these two announcements? No, what's the connection? And what's the connection to the time that we're in right now? And as we'll soon see, that this seemingly ancient, ancient law that has really, you can say, almost no relevance today because there's no temple, there are no offerings. We do commemorate the bringing of the half shekel the day before Purim on the fast of Esther during the Mincha service, the afternoon service, there's a custom to give a half coin. But, uh, but, but beyond that, what is the real powerful personal relevance to all of this to our lives? And what we'll discover as we explore this what we'll discover as we explore this is fascinating lessons in the issue of boundaries and harmony. So let's begin with the climb thing. Why is it forbidden to crossbreed certain species? By the way, not just in the vegetable kingdom, but also animals. You can't, according to the Torah, you can't just crossbreed every animal. It's precisely because, as the commentaries say, because of the boundary issue. There are boundaries in life. And respecting the boundaries is part of respecting the divine structure of existence. You know? Which is also why we find, even in, in, in many other many areas, that we are, you know, even the mechitza, the partition in a synagogue, reflects the distinction between male and female. Now you have this also, there's men's and women's tennis, and there's in the secular world you have plenty of distinctions, and no one sees it as a problem, because it's really recognizing and respecting the distinction. This does not make them separate in the sense where they don't have no relationship, on the contrary. With two people who are friends 
and they both respect each other's personality, that's what makes them closer, not more distant. So boundaries are not meant to separate, they're actually meant to unite by respecting the reality. Now, if we were all one-celled creatures and we were all one thing, then obviously it's all one thing. But the mere fact that we are different people, you have your opinion, I have my opinion, you have a different face, I have a different face, we all have our individuality. So respecting individuality is essentially the key to a true friendship and a true relationship. Annihilating individuality in the name of let's all work together is actually destructive. So the Torah is very adamant about boundaries when it comes to that. Do not mix certain things. And that is exactly the way you connect them. As I said before with electricity, if electricity decides, just using an imaginative uh, situation, that it wants to so much unite with the appliance, it wants to surge in with all its power, what will happen? It will destroy the appliance and destroy itself. The process of true healthy relationships is knowing not only when to give, but knowing when to stop. Like you need gas and you need the brakes. Good relationship is what we call chesed and gvura. So let's describe what that means. There are people who are givers, and they give and give and give to the point that they can hurt those they give to because there's no discipline, there's no limits. Children can be spoiled in the name of giving. If the water, we'll get to that in a moment, the waters. Then there's, of course, there's discipline. There are those parents that discipline their children and you don't see love at all. That's equally destructive because you don't have any flow. All you have is discipline. All you have is, every time you hear no, 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 you only hear refrain and withholding and withdrawing, that's not healthy. What's the perfect balance? A flow of love, but with restraints and discipline and seasoned and tempered that the recipient can receive it. A perfect example of this is rain. The Talmud tells of the drought, the droughts that would take place in Israel, which of course were very tragic because droughts was the key sustenance was based on the vegetation and the agricultural society. So a drought could literally be a matter of life and death. So once there was a big drought, and one of the rabbis went to pray for rain. He prayed and the rain came down, not just came down, came down in buckets, it came down a flood. It was so powerful, the rain, that it destroyed the fields because there was no limit. So he prayed a second time and he said an expression, So much good that we're unable to receive it. So what's worse, a drought or a flood? They're both a problem. And then his second prayer achieved the balance. Now what? That the rain came down in raindrops. If you think of the fascination of raindrops, it's a perfect balance. It's not a drought, because there's rain, but it's not flooding. It's in drops, which go at a certain speed, that the earth can absorb it before the new drops come. That's why you'll see when we simulate rain in watering gardens and so on, it's done in that way. Done in a way that there's a balance. Because even when giving chesed without limits is destructive. Is it as destructive as gvura without limits? Not measuring, but they're both destructive. So the perfect balance is knowing how to give, but give in a way that the recipient can receive. And very often in relationships you find this. Sometimes people want to give so much love, or they themselves are so needy that they don't know how to stop. And boundaries are crossed, and in the name of love, things are destroyed. In the name of rain, too much rain, too much water. So there's a need to be able to dance and balance, keep the balance in that, in that context. So that's where the mitzvah of Klaim, the mitzvah that I said, the separation of the species, is respecting the boundaries. Respecting the boundaries precisely in order to create unity. So as again, if the world was a world where there was no st- structures and no distinctions, that's one thing, but that's not the case. If you came into a situation, let's say, and um, let's say you have to be a mediator to mediate an argument, and then you, you in your mind you think falsely, that the two people are of the same personality. And you said, you know what, here's what I'm ruling, and both of you have to just follow this guideline. That is a person who's not respecting the individuals that are communicating. What does a good mediator do? A good mediator listens to one party, listens to the other party completely. They may completely contradict each other, and finds a way to respect each person's interests, because they may both have good points. We're not talking about a situation where one is complete criminal and the other person is completely in the right. It's usually not the case. In every case, it takes two to tango. You always need to have, there's usually two opinions. 
and you listen closely. Now, people who are not trained or are not professional or don't understand this will either come to quick decisions and they will not respect the boundaries. Or they may even create a situation of mediation that doesn't work. Because you know, to just tell, let's say, a, a married couple, you do this, you do that, it may just not work for the people because you haven't appreciated the individual involved. Like I said before with the rain, you can decide that this, this a person should be given, but the other person's not ready to contain it or not ready to absorb it. So the wisdom, which is really necessary in any type of true, what's called in Hebrew, hachra, mediation, is appreciation of the boundaries. And then you mediate. You don't just completely ignore the individuals you're dealing with. It's completely about that. And the more you understand this distinction, the, the, paradoxically, the more you can bring people together. Because then there's the respect of each one's strength. I mentioned before the symphony. You know, what does a conductor really do? There's, let's say, a hundred-piece ensemble of musicians. And they're playing very different type of uh, instruments. And not only different types of instruments, different types of sounds. And the symphony is uh, an hour long. And it goes through hundreds and thousands of different uh, musical variations and notes and so on. What is the conductor doing? He's respecting each one is doing their role. And when they play their instrument to the fullest, they're doing exactly what they need to do. But should they cross the boundary and suddenly play a little second longer, it disturbs the whole balance. So then they stop. So who says stopping is, more, is, is less part of the picture than going? Like I said before with the raindrops. What is more powerful in rain? The fact that the rain, rain is falling or the fact that it's raindrops? And not Rev Teva, as I said, too much good that will drown uh, the flood the field. The answer is both. If you want to really see a master teacher, a master communicator, you'll learn a lot more from what they don't say from what, than what they do say. Just like if you know design, the design on a page, what's more significant, the, the white space or the black space? There's a lot more white space on a page than there is black space, but you don't notice it. Because letters take up, because you read the letters, but the real balance is knowing when there should be white space, when there should be silence. And often the boundaries are the things that create the real structure. So it's not boundaries per se for boundary purposes. It's in order to respect the structure of existence. And that's where the mitzvah of Klayim, when I said on this day, Rosh Chodesh Shadr, and the first of other in the time of the temple, the announcement about Klayim, this mitzvah of knowing, respecting the boundaries. So the obvious question is, what does it have to do with, this, with, with the previous announcement, which is Shkolen? They also announced, as I said, the idea that everyone should give in this next month uh, the half shekel, the half coin, which was used for the new year, of the, uh, which started in Nisan, in the next month of Nisan, which is considered the first lunar month, the first, lunar, the first month of the lunar year, rather, Based on the, the verse in the Torah that says, when God told Moses he's going to redeem the Jewish people, it all began with the moon. He, told God, he, he took Moses out into the street, into the night, looked up into the heavens, and said, here, it's a big discussion, what did Moses see exactly? You can't see a new moon. That's the whole point. But without getting into the details, the bottom line is, this is the new month. And chedush in Hebrew also means new. It literally means new. Chedush in Hebrew, chadosh, is newness. So the month, the new month, is actually the word new. And just as this month is being renewed, for the first time I'm giving you the lunar year as a gift, the Jewish people will be renewed. Shehem asid in l'schadosh kamesa. They also will be renewed because the Jewish people are compared to the moon. And even when they're at the brink of the abyss, they seem to be completely extinct as the moon completely disappears. Just at that moment, there's a new birthing. So it's before the dawn... There's always the darkest moment, but don't think darkness is an end to it. So the moon became a symbol for all, for, for all people, but especially for the Jewish people, of renewal. That even when things seem to be going in the worst possible way, and everything seems to disappear, the moon is just born anew. So this month of Nisan, before that, the temple was as erected and assembled in that month of Nisan. So the month before that, they announced... This Rosh Chodesh, where we are, one month before that, they announced that we should that you should also bring these half coins that um, are, will be used to purchase the offerings. The offering, Karbonus Tzibur, the offerings that were offered, public offerings that were offered in the temple. What connection does that have to Klayim, which is boundaries? So if you think about it, it's very obvious. Because why, why is this month the month that you announce it? Because it's announcing it's a new year. And a new Trumah Chadasha, it's called. 
a new offering, a new contribution, a new appeal. It's respecting the boundary of time. That you could say, you know what, what's the difference? Why not just leave over some money from last year's uh, appeal and purchase the, the, the offerings from that money? Why, who really cares? So they won't give it this year. No, because there's a respect. Every year has a new energy, has a new cycle. As the new cycle begins, begins a new counting and a new appeal. So it's essentially also respecting the boundaries of time, the boundary of the new year. That's on a very basic level. But if you think about it further, it goes even deeper than that. What is a shekel? I mentioned this a few weeks ago when we spoke about it. In Judaism, it's a very fascinating idea that, that when you do something good, you should always do it in a complete way. If you do something bad, you shouldn't do something bad, but if you do it, at least don't do it completely, you know, with the whole, with your entire heart. But when it comes to Kedusha, to holiness, always do it completely. You know, that's why uh, when you bring an offering and the temple is meant to be from the best. You write a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll. Don't just write a Torah scroll, write it on beautiful, on a beautiful parchment, on klafna, on, with a nice ink. You know, in your home, Zekeli van Veyu. Because beauty is part of the perfection of this world. And when you're doing a good deed, do it with beauty. Don't just do it, um, uh, you know, mediocrely. In a real full way. And of course, the verse itself about the, the esrog, pre eats hodr. The esrog that we gather, one of the four species, on Sukkot, the Torah specifically says, doesn't even call it an esrog, it just says a beautiful uh, f- fruit of the tree. And they derive from different ways how we know it's a citron, which is an esrog that we use. But the expression of the Torah, eats pre eats hodr. And you see the, the, the emphasis on beauty again and again in the Torah. You talk about the the matriarchs, they say, you fast taya, you fast mara, they were beautiful. So though we say in the Eshes Chayel Friday night from the book of Proverbs that sheker hachein vehevel ayayfi, which means false is beauty or false is vanity and, uh, and empty is hollow is beauty, but that's when you don't have anything behind it. In other words, like today you see there are many things that are just beautiful on the outside there's nothing behind the surface. It's called... Um, you know, dishonest marketing, where you, the package is everything. Even though the most famous uh, um, false cliche is don't judge a book by its cover. Everybody judges a book by its cover. That's why it's a billion dollar industry design and creating covers and packages and everything. So you have a package. Now, hopefully, sometimes the packaging reflects that it's also a good product. But it doesn't have to be that way. So we live in a world where you could have very hollow beauty, which has nothing inside. And I've mentioned a number of times that in Hebrew, which is a very precise metaphorical language, the words mean things. So, for example, what is the name for a face in Hebrew? When we say a face, panim, panim is a face. But panim also has another meaning. It means internal. Pinim, pinimiyut, within, internally. When you say in English the word face, you say on the face of it, or the surface, you mean only surface. On the face of it, it looks this way. But when you look inside, it's something else. In Hebrew, interestingly, face and what's within are all consistent. Because there's a concept in Hebrew called, what we call hypocrisy, is echad bepeh, echad belev. Someone says one thing, but they mean something else. So they could smile to you and then stab you in the back. It's very common. It's called duplicity in this world. Sheker, false. But in Hebrew, which is a, true, a, a language of truth, there's no such thing as duplicity. What you see is what you get. A face of it reflects what's inside. Outer beauty reflects inner beauty. And inner beauty is expressed in outer beauty. That's the way it's meant to be. So in the Proverbs, King Solomon is telling us and warning us, don't be deceived by hollow and empty beauty and recognize what's within. That's why he says that the, the beauty and vanity is not that should, is, is on its own is hollow and false. What should you appreciate? Isha yiris Hashem hitisal. You should appreciate a woman of valor, a woman... That, is, that it stands in awe of God. That's what you should praise. But once you have the Ishi Yiris Hashem Kisal, then obviously the, then the, the Torah would not extol <coughs> the virtues of Sarah, um, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel as beautiful if for Shekhar Achain. Because once you have the inner beauty of a person of fear of God, <coughs> a God fearing human being, then absolutely that should express itself in outer beauty. So to go back to what I was discussing, <coughs> excuse me, what I was discussing before about um, about boundaries and about um, about about shkolim, 
So I was saying the following. So when you look at something, and you see, you see, you see something that you're doing that is holy or or good, do it with complete heart. Be there completely. If you're not, now again, this is not a condoning or, uh, 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 but we will we may we will make mistakes in our lives. At least when you make a mistake, make sure don't do it with your complete passion. You know, you should at least recognize that it's, it's, it's something wrong. So when you're doing something positive, as Maimonides, the Rambam writes, you should always bring minatev v'anifcher v'ayofa, which means always bring the best when you're doing something holy. When you're doing someone a favor, when you're doing something positive, bring the best that you have. Which is why we have the mitzvah of Bikurim, for example, when the Jews entered Israel, <coughs> So the first fruit offering. Why? Because Bikurim, like the word Bechar, everything from the first, bring to God as a, as a gratitude and sowing. That's why the Bechar, the firstborn, the first fruit. Even the morning when we wake up, we say Modani, the first fresh moments of your day, thank, thank God for giving you life. Because you give from the best <clears throat> to the holiest. So then the question is then, which is why in the temple everything was done with completeness. For example, this week's chapter, when Moses gives an accounting of the temple, he makes it clear that not one drop was wasted. That means you really used everything perfectly. Not more and not less. Perfect balance. And uh, so the question then is asked, so why, of all things, one thing is given only in halves. The machzis a shekel. Why then should the shekel be a half? Half indicates it's not complete. That's exactly the word, half of a coin, half of a measure, half a dollar. Why not give a full shekel? Which would seem to indicate far more the expression of giving of all of you. Why half? And there are different explanations given, but here comes the point I made a few weeks ago, maybe it was last week even, where the expression that they say, it's a Yiddish expression, but I'll translate it, I'll say it, then I'll translate it. They say, there's no, stuck in Krim Rezach, I'm sorry. She's talking krimer zach via gleicher later. She's talking gleicher zach via via krimer zach via gleich vertel, and she's talking ganze zach via zebrochene hearts. It means the following: There's nothing as as crooked as a straight lie. There's nothing as straight as a crooked ladder. And there's nothing as complete as a broken heart. So. A broken heart, how could you say that's complete? Something broken is not complete. But that's not true. Because when you really are committed to something, and you're not detached and aloof, your heart will break for it. So what would you rather have? Someone that's a detached, cold-blooded individual that, you know what, everything is fine, nothing bothers me. Or would you rather have somebody that says, I love you or I love, I love this so much that it breaks my heart when I don't have it, or breaks my heart when the, that person is in pain. So what's more complete? Complete is more than the word complete. Yes, when you talk about a broken table, is more bro- a complete table is better than a broken table. But when it comes to, however, reality, you want the real picture. You want something real. Complete in Hebrew is not just complete, it means that it's real. And in a situation where something is painful, and we make ourselves like we're complete, like nothing happened, like someone will say, I, God forbid, experience a trauma, and they say, how are you? Everything is cool, everything is fine. Besides it being false, that's not complete. That means you're not healthy. You're not feeling the pain of, of, of the situation. Where someone says something happened, and says, you know, my heart is broken, I'm hurt. That can be more complete than someone who says they're complete, because it all comes down to what the real experience is. So for someone to make believe like something's not happening, that's not reality. So when it comes, there's one therefore mitzvah in the Torah that reminds us that we're not complete human beings without another half. So some comment, some places it says the other half is God. We bring the half a coin and God fulfills the second half. And sometimes it's described as two Jews. Avis Yisrael, when one person loves another and the other one reciprocates. That we're not complete. Like in the words of Hillel, if I'm not for myself, who am I? Okay, so we need to be on our own, complete as we can. But then he has a second half of the statement. Imanila atzmi, if I am for myself, what am I? So we live in a world, as I said before, where as much as we are individuals, and no two of us are alike, we also complement each other. And it's not a contradiction. 
you'll find people who are very secure and comfortable in their own skin. And they're very, very much aware of their own identities and comfortable with their identities can coexist with anybody. People who are not, who are insecure, who wonder what their identity is like, always find that someone is taking something away from them because they themselves, don't, if you don't know who you are, how do you know the other person maybe is taking something away from you? But if you know who you are, you're very confident and very secure. You see most projects fall apart, whether it's uh, whatever project, because of these issues of insecurity, jealousies, pettiness. The projects that work well is either because someone at the head is very healthy and knows how to keep everybody and gives everybody exactly their job descriptions without crossing boundaries, or the people themselves are very secure and professional in what they do, and they understand exactly what they're good at, and they're fine with someone being good at what you do, what you do is excellent, and what I do is excellent, and we join our excellence together. It requires a combination of self-awareness, but also what's called in Hasidic terminology, bittel, also a certain humility and recognizing I'm not good at everything, and it's perfectly fine. Or in the context of arguments, you'll find people who love to argue, and they can never be wrong. You know, you have that syndrome. You know, there are some people that you have to be wrong for me to be right. If you're so confident in your position, why do I have to be wrong? Maybe you're right, and fine, be, be comfortable with your right. Why do you need to change my mind? Why do I have to be wrong for you to be right? Maybe you're not so confident. And if the whole world is saying to you, you know, like that joke that they tell the guy who's driving on the highway, and he gets a call from his wife, and she says to him, she says to him Yankel, you better be careful, because there's a report that someone's driving on the highway in the wrong direction. And he says to her, everybody's driving in the wrong direction. You know, he was the guy, you know, obviously. Um, so sometimes there's someone's, and they need everybody to feel like, you know, since if, if I am going to be right, I may have to make sure everyone else says I'm right. Um, so it's obviously a study in psychology and human nature, but the fact of the matter is you'll find the secure people um, are the ones that are the most comfortable with, with opinion that disagrees with them. No problem. You disagree, fine. First of all, it doesn't affect me. You can, you know, you can you stay with your position. I stay with mine. Secondly, I'm willing to hear because I, you know, I thought it through. I'm confident in my position, and those those people are also the first ones that are easy to say. You know, I stand corrected. You brought up a good point. I'll stand corrected. The more insecure someone is, the less they will ever acknowledge mistakes, because it's part of their insecurity. They they don't feel secure to acknowledge a mistake. Someone who's secure doesn't have a problem with that. You know, like I remember I was once going to uh, meet somebody, I don't know, it was a confrontational meeting. Not that it was my choice, but I got stuck in the situation, what can I tell you? Anyway, I, um, so I called somebody that I knew, that, who knew this guy. I said, how do you get through to this guy? He says, forget about getting through to him. And he said one line that just struck me, I couldn't stop laughing. He said to me, he hides his ignorance with his arrogance. He hides his ignorance with his arrogance. And man, it was a perfect description, because then I met the guy, and he came with books. He wanted to prove a point to me. He put books and books and books and books. But I already, you know, first of all, you could tell immediately when a guy trying to prove something. But once, once I heard that, it was just, you know, to me, okay, you know, I, I didn't even get into an argument. It's like some things are not worth arguing. So some people hide their arrogance with their ignorance, and sometimes they hide it with other things. Did I say they hide their arrogance? With their, no, the other way around. They hide their ir- ir- ignorance with their arrogance. And sometimes, so therefore, when you see somebody behave sometimes in a way that's obnoxious or condescending or judgmental, just don't be judgmental in return because it could simply be a hurt child who doesn't, you know, I'm not trying to be patronizing, but sometimes that's what it is. A person who, unfortunately, has gotten trapped, either they've been over-criticized in their lives, and they're fighting for their turf, and they've not been respected, and they're trying to find some respect when you look with that attitude, you generally can diffuse a lot of matters. I'm not saying you can always help the situation, but don't always get engaged with everyone who wants to fight with you. It's not always coming from a healthy place on the other side. So you've got to choose your battles. This is somewhat of a, we call a maimer hamuzger, a footnote, a tangential point. But to get back to the theme here, so Shekel teaches us a tremendous lesson that on one hand, to use the words of the Mishnah, Ezu chachem halemen mekol adam. Who is the wise person, the one that learns from everybody? And there's two lessons in that. That everyone has something to learn, and everyone has something to teach. So in an interesting way, this is how Chazal, our sages, 
in their wisdom, in their precise one line, give us two lessons. These two lessons themselves are volumes. That everyone, who is the wise person, the one who learns something from everyone. But that means everyone has something to teach. So you find a fascinating law in Jewish law, in Jewish law laws of charity. It says that everybody's obligated to give charity. Not just, I'm talking about financial, monetary charity. Even a pauper. You could say, well, a pauper doesn't have money. I mean, why are they obligated to give charity? And the answer, the obvious answer, is because, number one, the dignity. Everyone has something to give. A pauper may not be able to give much, but it's not quantity. It's about the ability to give. And to write off a person and say, you're so poor that you have nothing to give for the Torah, that's worse than saying, don't give anything because we have Rahman's compassion on your financial situation. The dignity that you have something to give. Again, as much as you can give, or she. So you have this concept of human dignity, Salam Alekim, that each of us is creating the divine image. And no matter who you are, you have what to teach. And whoever you are, you have something to learn from and everybody. There's no exception. Which is why you find the Talmud interesting stories of the greatest sages learning things from people who are completely not in their own league. Because that's the lesson. What does that tell you? That we are both things. On one hand, each of us can give a half a coin, but at the same time, we're always half. We're never complete without the other. And that doesn't take away from your perfection. On the contrary, it makes you more perfect. Because you can learn from others and you can grow through others. If you are a self-contained individual and everything was figured out on your own, you would never learn to grow. There's an interesting question that's asked in, the, in Hebrew when they talk about the four kingdoms, the four species. You say there's, uh, in, our, in English you say there's the, the mineral world, the vegetable world, the animal world, and the human, sometimes the four kingdoms. In Hebrew the expression is daimim tzameach, Chai Medaber. So Daimim literally means mineral, inanimate. So that's the whole world of the inanimate. I mean, on a surface level today, we know it's buzzing with uh, pulsating subatomic particles. Then you have Semeach, things that grow, vegetation, or they call it um, fauna. Then you have flora, which is, uh, or the other way around. No, flora is uh, vegetation, right? And fauna. Then comes Chai. Chai means life, the animal kingdom. And then when it comes to the fourth one, interesting, it doesn't say the human, which would be uh, Adam or uh, Ish. or uh, It says Medaber, the speaker, the one that speaks. Now why is that the description of the human being? So one explanation given for this is because obviously a human being has many qualities. We have intelligence. I mean, human, animals also have intelligence. Even, you can say, even plants have intelligence. But their intelligence is called das hanikna. It means essentially natural intelligence, the intelligence they need to survive and to function. But they don't have imagination, they don't have the ability to dream, the ability to go beyond and transcend themselves. Where do you see the biggest expression of the transcendent human being is in our ability to communicate with each other. So if we were just self-contained intelligent creatures, that's also a quite a fine quality. But true intelligence you see is an ability to communicate, the ability to speak. But medaber doesn't just mean speak, it also means to listen. Even though the word means to speak, but it means the process of speaking and listening, communicating. You know, there's a... Uh, there's a Talmud that uh, the, the mission in, in, in the Ethics of the Fathers says it um, describes the chronological growth of a human being. It says, Ben Chomish, when you're five years old, you're, re you're ready to begin to read the written Torah, Mikra, ten years old, the Mishnah, and so on and so forth. Then it gets to, like I said, it gets Ben Esrim, Ben Shleshim, then by 40 years old, it says Esrim Labina. I'm sorry, Ben Arboim Labina. When you turn 40, you gain the quality of Bina. Bina means a certain mature understanding. Now, it doesn't mean there's no Bina before. You know, Chachma, Bina, Das. But there's a certain maturity that settles in Bina that, that comes with experience that happens when you're around age 40. It doesn't necessarily mean the moment you turn 40. It means that period. Then comes the next, Ben Chamishim, the next 10 years. Chamishim, La'etza. La'etza means literally advice. 
So everybody interprets it that by the time you're 50, you give good counsel because now you're an experienced human being and you give good counsel. You can give advice and it's worthy hearing your advice because you have what to say. So when 20 years old, it doesn't have that quite that level of seasoning and experience. But I have to say, when I turned 40, um, so I don't know if I gained more Bino or not, that's another question, but I can tell you this. I think when you turn 40, you come to realize that Ben Hamishim doesn't mean giving advice, it means taking advice. So before you're 40 years old, you think Eitzah means, oh, I'm about 50, everybody's going to come to me for advice. But when you turn 40, you become wiser, you come to learn that maybe 50 means that you're ready to take advice. That's just a thought. I'm not saying it's the literal interpretation. I just wanted to share my, since you're all young people and you haven't reached this ripe old age yet, maybe when you get there, let me know what happens. You know, com- compare notes. But the point I'm trying to say is that wisdom, wisdom, siyog l'chach mashtika, the siyog means the support, the gate, the support of wisdom is shtika, silence. You see more in the silence of a wise person more wisdom than you see when they speak. When a wise person speaks, they have wisdom to share. But what about when a wise person has what to share and they decide that's not the time to share it? So if you recognize that, you'd find much deeper wisdom in the silence than in the speaking. Because it takes a lot more power for someone intelligent to be quiet than to speak. You know, sometimes to restrain yourself from saying an opinion may be wiser, but it's not obvious. So bottom line is that the truth, in, the truth in life and the healthy truth in life is that we live in a world of structure and boundaries and we recognize that on one hand, to be complete, you have to feel like you're half. So as paradoxical as it sounds, that's exactly the story. The whole natural kingdom I described earlier, when bees come to pollinate flowers, do they feel complete or they do not feel complete? On one hand, they need the nectar for their own sustenance. On the other hand, the, the, the flowers need them to pollinate, cross-pollinate the flowers. That's the perfect example. I'm complete because I know that I'm both doing what I have to do and know also I need someone else to compliment me. That's the healthiest boundary you'll ever find. So is that unity or is that separation? If you really think about it in, objectively, without personal agendas, it's exactly true. The machzis shekel, the half shekel, is more complete than a complete shekel in a way. Because it recognizes its need to be part of something else. And that doesn't take away from your half. Your half remains your half. And the other half needs you as much as you need it. So if you take the ego out of the equation, and you take personal interests out of the equation, it's exactly the way the healthy b- b- being should be. Think of the human body. If your human body, if all your organs and your systems were competing for resources, we would be dead immediately. The whole beauty of a healthy body is that every part of the body knows when to give and knows when to step back. Not everyone's fighting for the same resources. It's actually, autoimmune disease is one of the worst diseases is when your body starts eating itself up because it's lost its sight of that respect of boundaries while at the same time understanding that everything needs each other and everything needs to contribute to one another. So the challenge is how do we incorporate this in our personal lives? But let me just finish with the point. So then, this is what the Mishnah says. On the first day of Adar, which of course also connects, Adar is connected to joy, and I'll get to that in a minute. On this day, you declare, Mashmin ala shkolim v'ala klayim. You announce the time for, for bringing the shekel, which, as I said before, the boundary of time, it's a new year, but it's also the boundary of, the psychological boundary of understanding that you are always half. And that right away leads into climb, which is that also the way you develop produce in this world, the way you plant, remember in the agricultural society, everything was built around the farm. The way you plant should also be done with the same respect of boundaries. Things don't have to all become join as one for it to be complete. Completion means understanding each place, each thing in its place. The wisdom of perfect things is not understanding how everything is one, it's understanding that the oneness is not a contradiction to the diversity. Harmony within diversity. And this is a central theme that you'll find throughout Judaism everywhere. The number three. I mentioned before, the 
Hachras. I'll, I'll, I'll just show you how that reflects everywhere, in every situation. You have like this. It says God created the world in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. So then it says the first day created light. Right? But he are Yom Echad. Yom Sheni, he created, he separated the lower heavens from the higher. Arakiah. The third day he created vegetation. That the land should produce. So it says the following. Each day, after the day was over, the, to- the Torah tells us, right in the beginning of Genesis, everything God, God looked at what he did. He said, it's good. It's good. Okay. On day two, that verse is missing. So you have it on day one, on day three, on day four, day five, and day six. Only day two is missing the key tev. But when you look closely at day three, you see it says twice tev. It's called Yem Shlichshi, the third day, Chuchpo Boy Ki A double twice tev. And again on the sixth day, by the way, is a second good. So the, the Talmud tells us in Kedushan, in this tractate, says the following. <clears throat> because on day two, because God created division, separation, which is the creation really of the potential of Machlekes, of the divisiveness, so you can't say good yet because we don't know how it's going to go. This division of higher and lower could end up being a battle. But on day three, when the third dimension comes and unites the two, you know now it's gone toward what we call shalom. In Hebrew, the word shalom means peace. But shalom means more than peace. It also means complete. You know, because peace could also be the absence of war for some people. If there's no war, it's peace. In Judaism, no, no. An absence of war is not... It's like saying love is the absence of hate. Love is a lot more than the absence of hate. I know for some people the standards have gotten so low. If there's no hatred, it means it's love. But true love is an entity of its own. And true peace is not just absence of battle. True peace means a complete state. The end of the Talmud says, God did not found a container that contains blessing, only peace. Why? Why peace? There's a lot of blessing, could be so many other things, children, health, good family, knowledge. Why peace? Because peace does something that nothing else does. It takes diverse forces that could be potentially divisive and turns them into one harmony. And that is indestructible. So on day one, you can't say double good because all you had was one. One unit. It says, Hashem Echad, God's unity prevailed, light, divine light. Day two was a separation where God created the structure and the boundaries of existence. The boundaries were created day two. So for the naked eye, the boundaries can seem as being you know, a problem. It's far easier to have unity on day one because there's no other opinion. There's only one opinion in existence. It's God's opinion. Or like you know, some people say, I'd love to be the only person on earth and I'm the only opinion. There's no other opinion. But God created two opinions. Two really is symbolic of meaning diversity. Diversity can lead to divisiveness. Comes day three and teaches, which is really the growth, <coughs> that teaches harmony. In the Kabbalistic structure of spheres, day one is chesed, day two is gvura, and day three is teferis. And teferis has another name for it besides harmony, beauty. Teferis is a name for beauty. Because what's beautiful? You can have a beautiful color blue. You can have a beautiful color red. But we don't call that beauty. You won't say blue is beautiful. You know where you see beauty? Beauty is always where there's a combination of different hues and colors. And they're joined in the proper way. Then you call it, you see a beautiful face. You may say, I like blue. I like the color blue. It's my favorite color. Same thing with music. One sound, as beautiful as it is, it will become very monotonous and very dull if you just hear one sound. Real beautiful music means many sounds, but played in the right order, and that creates a harmony. <clears throat> now, if played the wrong order, it creates noise and chaos. Just like the blood, blue and, and other colors mixed the wrong way, it's, it's very disturbing. So one unit always is simpler than two. But to achieve beauty, to achieve a dimension of transcendence, you require harmony within diversity is the only true type of beautiful thing there is. That's why there's nothing as powerful when you see different people. 
come together toward one cause. Because that's precisely its power. Because they have so many different strengths. Each, and they could have been at war with each other. And yet they've joined together and they, com- they complement each other. And you'll see this throughout the whole of Judaism. For example, the first month that was soon coming to Nisan is considered Chedesh Harishan. The first month, God took the Jews out of Egypt. That's Chesed. Chesed Nuraich. Then comes month two, which is the month of Ir, when we count Sphira and we count the Omer, which is compared to Gvura. That's why it's days of sadness. We don't do weddings due to the events that happened then. And then comes month three. Teferis, Teferis Zemat and Torah. The Torah was given in the month of Sivan, the month of beauty. What does Torah do? Torah brings together Chesed and Gvura and joins them into one harmony, the third month. And that's why the Talmud says it's the month, the third month, Yarchit Lusai, that the Torah, which is made up of three, Tanakh, was given to the nation of three, a whole bunch of threes. Because three is what symbolizes that the fair is the beauty of harmony. And we say in the morning, every day in the prayer, we say, from the, from the Talmud, we say, from the Medrash, we say that there are two verses that contradict each other. Shneik Suvi Machishim Zeh Two verses, they contradict each other. And comes the third verse, and reconciles them. For example, the classic example for that is, in one verse in the Bible it says that God spoke to, the, to Moses and to the Jewish people from the kaperis, from the covering on top of the ark in the Holy of Holies. And another place it says, God spoke to them from Pesach El-Maid, from the door of the tabernacle in the temple. So it seems like a contradiction. Where did the voice originate from? Here or there? So then in the one chapter, so, so Rashi, at the end of chapter Nose, says, comes the third verse, and says that the voice originated from the cover on the ark, but it traveled through the door of the Almod to reach the people. So it had both dimensions to it. So of course the obvious question is asked, what do you need two verses to contradict and then bring a third verse? Why don't you just say the first, third verse and you won't have a problem in the first place? And it's exactly the same reason. Because the question really is that the voice of God, was it on God's terms or on our terms? So coming from the Kaporos and the Holy of Holies, nobody ever entered there. That would mean it retained a certain divine dimension that was beyond us. Coming through the door of the tabernacle of the Oyel Mayed would imply that it's more on our terms. And you want to have both elements. You want to have the divine on divine terms and you want to have the divine on our terms. So comes the third verse and says it had both qualities. So every verse plays its role. And you can't have the third verse without the first two because you need the strength of each one. It's like having a translator who speaks, let's say, translates between Hebrew and English. So they need to know Hebrew, they need to know English to understand the language of the two parties. And then... They need to know both languages and then they translate it properly. You need, each thing has its role in existence. So to go back to the discussion of boundaries. So really when it comes down to this, boundaries were never meant to separate. They were meant to unite. But to unite in a structured universe, you have no choice but to work with boundaries. To unite two people who are different, by ignoring their differences, you're not uniting them, you're creating chaos. By uniting things that are different, you're not, you're not benefiting anyone. The key is to pre- appreciate and respect each half in its particular place. And to take this one step further, which maybe is, I hope I convey, do justice to the topic. It's a very profound topic in, in Hasidic, Chabad Hasidic thought, and it goes like this. We live in a world of boundaries and limitations because we're limited people. What does that mean? We need to sleep. We need to eat. We have... Natural limitations. You can only jump that high. You can only throw a stone that far. You know, we have, all, wherever we turn, we have limitations. Your eyes can see that far, you know. So even the best perfect human being is going to be limited. There's a certain defined limits and that's that. When you talk about God, we talk about God in a limitless way. There's no boundaries at all. God is not defined by anything. There's nothing that is it's called yachol, meaning unlimited in every possible way. It goes a step further even. The Kabbalists say that God is unlimited even by the word unlimited. Because that too is a limit. Because if you say God is infinite, but doesn't have the power of the finite, that too is saying that it's finite because it's only infinite and not finite. 
That's how far it goes. So therefore they say the following, that God is not not infinite and not not finite, beyond all of them, and therefore can combine all of them. Okay. Now, we can't relate to that because we barely are, as I said, we are true finite creatures. We're mortal. We born, we die. We have our limitations even while we're alive and all that, that goes with that. The Rabbeinu B'chayi says that a child, as soon as it's born, begins to die. I know it sounds depressing, but it means it begins to age because we don't begin to age when we turn 80. You begin to age. Anything in this universe begins to erode the moment it exists. However, you don't see it till later. So that's not, you know, you don't see it till the first wrinkle appears on your face. But a wrinkle didn't come from nowhere. It came from enough time, times of uh, change that then finally it, uh, it turns into something that's obvious. So this world is defined by, by definition. So the big question that the Kabbalists, especially the Hasidic masters, want to know, can these two worlds ever meet? God wants a relationship with the mortal world and the mortal human being. How could that be without one annihilating the other? Because if it's divine, fine, it's divine, and we have to be subsumed and completely annihilated or like swallowed up by the divine. Fine, that makes sense. But how can we remain in our mortal state and some way have a relationship with God? One has to give. Someone has to compromise. So ultimately the answer is that since God is not bound by the rules of finite and infinite, who, who said this rule applies from God's point of view? The question is, however, from our point of view, how can we relate to that? So they say, in some Hasidic text, they say there's a concept of two types of understanding of the finite structure. You can see the finite structure as humans see it. It's finite, it's this, it's not that, it's limited, and that's that. But what about if an infinite entity decided that it wants to place itself for a moment in a finite state? Would that be considered finite or infinite? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if you took a, uh, if, for example, um, um, an artist, hypothetically, who can create an infinite amount of pieces of art, literally infinite. And this artist now has chosen to create one piece of art. Has, is this a limit for him, or just one expression of his infinite possibilities? That's one example given. Another example. You write, when you write with a pen, let's say you're writing letters, so clearly when you write A, B, C, D, the letters are very distinct. That's what uh, communication is all about. Distinct letters. Distinct letters that mean words and so on. But what about right before you begin writing? You have an unlimited ability to write any type of words. I'm talking about, obviously, but potentially. In actuality, no human being can write forever. But potentially, there's nothing that limits what you're going to write. So there's what's called in Hasidic language, it's called gvul, and it's called the koyach gvul. Gvul would mean the structure, and the koyach gvul means the power to create structure. So when now we talk about um, structure of existence, that very clear is a clear structure. The sun sets at a certain time and rises at a certain moment. Everything has its rules. There are rules. But I mentioned before the quantum state of reality, what's called the state of um, in, indeterminism, where a light, is it a wave or is it a particle? Or using Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that says you can never know the velocity and the position of an atom at the same time. Which means there are things that are uncertain, fundamentally uncertain, not because we have lack of knowledge, but because it's fundamentally in a state of probability, of indeterminism. So when you think of that, so one second, what is that? Is that a structure or not a structure? So there's some discourses, Hasidic discourses, that explain that, for example, when God said, I want you to keep Shabbos, and on the seventh day, when the sun sets on Friday, Shabbos begins, and then a sun sets, or an hour after the sun sets, on, uh, when, the, when the stars come out on Saturday night, Shabbos ends. And this isn't just a small matter. A minute before is not Shabbos, a minute after is. Same thing with Passover. And there are rules. There are rules that have serious, severe penalties if you break them. Real boundaries. So this looks like a complete boundary structure. You do a mitzvah only this way and not this way. You can't do it two ways. I'm talking about those mitzvahs that are very precise. The question is, how does an infinite God bind himself to finite rules like that? 
So they, so the way the the Hasidic masters put it, they say this called Hagbola Atzmis. It means a a finite state that's willed by an infinite state is not really finite, because it's still a, just an expression of the infinite infinity of the entity. We can't perceive that because we're defined by the finite. So, for example, if you see uh, someone who is sitting, and I've seen this in my life, sitting under a talus, under a prayer shawl, seven hours praying on Shabbos, and doesn't move, is this person in a finite state or an infinite state? And then you see someone else who has millions of frequent flyer miles, and they're traveling all over the world. So who's traveling further? So you can say the person who's sitting in one place seems to be very limited. But if he chooses to be there, and the other person is running for his life because he doesn't know what his life is about, so he's running from one place to another, just because one's moving around doesn't mean that they're free. Freedom is the choice that nothing imposes itself upon you to do what you're doing. If you're doing it as a conformist, it doesn't matter whether it looks like you're a free spirit, it doesn't mean it's free. If you, by your own volition and choice, decide, I want to sit right now and read a book for five hours, who cares what others look? The others may think you've been forced to do so, but you know that you're not forced. That is called a, a, infinite, a finite infinity. Because it's defined not because you have to do it, but because you want to do it. So they explain that when God shows mitzvahs to be defined by certain things, he chose the finite. And choosing the finite doesn't make it finite. For us, creatures of the world, of this finite world, it's absolutely finite because it's structured. But in truth, it's a boundary that really has no boundaries. That's why you have the expression in the Torah that says uh, that, that Israel, Jerusalem, right? The old Jerusalem is surrounded by a wall. So then it says in the verse, Praze is Teshav Yerushalayim. That when Mashiach comes, the walls will open up. And instead of being a wall of stone, it will be a wall of fire. What is the meaning of that? Because there are walls that confine and there are walls that free us up. Just like they say, there's some dance to remember and some dance to forget. There's, there are walls that are meant to unite and there are walls that separate. So in a world that's limited, we need the separations. But in a world that is ultimately connects to higher states of being, then the infinite and the finite are not a contradiction, just like boundaries are not a contradiction to harmony. As I mentioned before, it's harmony within diversity. So this last piece of this talk that I've been giving may be a little more dense and complicated. I just want to throw it in for, the, for good measure and for, uh, for having a deeper understanding of it. So at the end of the day, we begin with boundaries because we have no choice, because we live in a world of boundaries. But ultimately, our boundaries can become so-called infinite boundaries, where the boundaries themselves become a container for that which is boundaryless. But you can only do it through that boundary. It's like you have to be able to do it through the structure. Through structure, you can learn to transcend structure. And if you try to break the structure prematurely, you won't get there. And this is true in all relationships. When two people truly love each other, to go back to the initial discussion about boundaries, two people truly love each other in a healthy way, you'll find two things happening at once. Number one, they love each other to the point that there's almost no boundary because they're completely one and they will be ready to sacrifice and give to each other endlessly, but there's also simultaneously a paradoxical point. They absolutely have space that they leave for each other. They respect each other's individuality. Unity does not mean one person gets annihilated. How those two things come together is because there's a divine power that allows that joining to happen. So we begin with creating space, a relationship you need to create space. Someone says to you, listen, don't be overwhelming now, I need my space. That's part of a relationship where you respect that and you don't feel offended. Once you learn to respect people's space, and you learn also to be, as they say, when you're when, when in love, when you're close, when you should be distant, you'll end up being distant when you should be close. When human beings need, even people who love each other, their space, that's part of the closeness, respecting that space. When people make the mistake and say, why, if we love each other, I want to be with you all the time, 24-7. That's not love. That's, like I said before, that's a love without, without healthy boundaries. Part of love is recognizing the person that's space. And you should work, you should celebrate their space, just like they would celebrate your space. And once you do that enough times, those boundaries that seemingly seem to be space end up becoming part of a higher unity. 
So even in our own human lives, that are, we are mortals, and in our finite structures, our structures can also become part of something that's greater. Just like the musical symphony I mentioned before. If one musician says, hey, I want to keep on playing my violin, why you don't let me play further? That's, of course, something, someone that's out of whack. But the mere fact that you're stopping right now, your silence is part of the symphony, because you're not just letting another instrument play, but your silence is also part of it. You keep playing, it's going to defeat your own sound. And you'll see this in any given situation, knowing the restraint is just as powerful as the expression. And bowing back to finally saying why we're called medaber, the human being a medaber, because when we speak to each other in a healthy way, real healthy communication, I'm not talking about texting now and this social media thing called friends, which means friends you never meet. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about true heart-to-heart, face-to-face communication. Speaking means speaking and listening is the ultimate transcendent. That means I may have my opinion, I may have a strong opinion, I may be intelligent, but you know something, I respect you enough and give you the dignity, I want to hear what you have to say. And not only do you listen, but you learn from it. Like I said, you learn from it. And you have something to teach, and you have something to give. And that type of balance and dance is the key to the, this con- concept. So, you know, we live in a world where people just have problems with boundaries, boundary issues, as they call it. And um, obviously you have to st- begin step by step. Some people do need therapy and need to go through why they have boundary issues based on what they learned or they picked up from their homes or from environments that had boundary problems. But I try to give a broader perspective on this, not just in the point of view of unhealthy boundaries to healthy boundaries, but to understand what boundaries are in the first place. Because when you understand them well, in the context, like I said, this day of other, the first of other, when you understand them well, you learn to figure out how they help, they complement each other. It's not just, oh, you know what, I'll compromise because I love that person. Fine, I'll compromise on my needs and boundaries because I love that person. No, it's on the contrary. That love is expressed that by giving space, you're actually creating more unity than the other way around. And it all leads into the, I said, the first of other is simcha, joy. If you think of joy, healthy joy, healthy joy, as Maimonides writes, is a, is a, in a way, it's a, also a paradox. Because on one hand, joy is opposed to what's called in, in Simcha, as opposed to what's called in Judaism, Oynig, is often the difference between holidays and Shabbos. So even though they both have an element of pleasure and both have an element of joy, but Simcha cannot be done alone. That's why the primary mitzvah of Achnos Sarchim, of inviting guests, is on holidays. Even though we do so on Shabbos as well, Yem Simcha Aschem El Shabbos also has an element of joy. But primarily, Mayudim La Simcha, is primarily on holidays. And that's why. Why? Because celebration, you see, when someone's celebrating a wedding, a bar mitzvah, a bas mitzvah, or just a celebration of holiday, it's not a full celebration when you celebrate alone. You want others there. Oinig, which means it's much more a peaceful type of contentment, you could be alone and sitting and reading a sefer, a book, learning, studying, enjoying music, and have pleasure. But simcha is something about it requires the synergy or the, com- the, 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 the participation of others. So on one hand, simcha is like joining others in your joy. But at the same time, does that obliter- obliterate the individual boundaries between people? No, you could have people dancing together, celebrating together with you, celebrating for you, for your child's marriage or whatever it may be, and yet they still remain individuals. So simcha is an interesting thing. Everyone is uplifted without being annihilated. Healthy joy. I'm not talking about where anybody's being forced or something that's, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, that's toxic. I'm talking about healthy form of joy. So it's interesting, Echad Ba'adr, that's the day when joy, Marben B'Simchi, you start increasing in joy. And this year, actually, because of the first other, so it's the second month, we continue to grow in it. But essentially, like a connection, that the joy, the other joy, is connected to the theme of Shkolem and Klein, which is how boundaries and distinctions help create harmony, and ultimately that harmony within diversity. Okay, I'm sure we could elaborate more on this topic, but like talking about boundaries, we need to make a boundary here too, because there is a curfew, after all, in New York, right? Um, what do they say? They say is that uh, 
Uh, that's why by Simchas Torah, even Simchas Torah, when there's almost no boundaries, and you're dancing, it's called Hakafas. Hakafa means a circle going around and around. We know circles are endless. Circle is the symbol of infinity. Because where does the circle begin? Where does it end? But nevertheless, you say, At Khan Hakafa Aleph. You even then have to say, it, until now, the, the infinity, number one, has to stop. Because we live in a world where we ultimately have to uh, breathe space. As even Moses was space between chapter and chapter. So what we like to say is that we take a small break until the next uh, coming together. So we'll do that. Take a small break, which will last around six days, until next Wednesday night, next Akafa. And we'll continue our uh, infinite journey in a finite universe. And may everybody be blessed in this month of other. It should be a month of joy for all of you, for each one of us. Real joy in personal lives and finding the right um, blessing, soulmate for those that need to find that. And there should be simcha, especially in the Holy Land of our brothers and sisters. We should not need to continuously be, uh, like we hear about the latest tragic attacks, be able to live without looking over their shoulders. And should be real simcha, salam al reshem, joy for the entire world, peace in the entire world, shalom. And anyway, I could be of help to anyone in their journey, um, I say to all of you here, but also to those online. Um, please see me as an asset, a resource. And uh, it's an honor, as I always say, to intersect kindred spirits and souls, where each of us has our individual strengths, but we also learn from each other. And though may, I may have been doing the medabir here, the speaking, you never know. Sometimes you grow more from, uh, yeah, I may be hearing more than listening and hearing more what you're saying than you may be hearing what I'm saying. Let's hope it's a dance that uh, complements each other. And um, if you haven't left your email address, please leave leave it. And uh, until next Wednesday, everyone very be well. Have a blessed week. Thank you. Okay. Yes. No, well, every tragedy is a tragedy. Uh, yeah, yeah, because they can stop streaming it. But I was talking about Israel, stabbing, I don't know. In Uruguay as well, I think.